All right, start it off, Sam. This is my baby cat, Tickles. <laughs> Actually, Judy is living her uh, happiest life right now, but she's really gross. I don't know if you can see this like grease slick across her back. She's a dirty camp cat now. You gonna give us a little tour of camp? Sure. This is where you've been living for the summer? Probably since April. Jay and I have, our house has sat vacant all summer, which is kind of too bad. But yeah, this is my camp. My grandpa bought it in the 40s. And yeah, welcome. We lived in that camper for the last couple months. There's the old camp that Sam's brother and wife live in. And this is new camp, cabin, what do we call it? This is the cabin. That's camp, that's the camper, that's the garage. Garage. <laughs> People are gonna get mad about that. Welcome to my crib. Bathroom, Sam's camp kitchen. This is Jay's office. Yeah, this is where I spend a lot of the time editing. As you can see, I've got a little bit of lake view right there. Bedroom's back there. This is my office where I sit to have my morning tea, where I sit to do my work. What do you do for work, Sam? People ask. Cook the books. <laughs> this is my cat, Rudy. As you can see, they're living their best happy cat lives. The cats are just so happy living out at the lake, letting them be outside hunting. They're killing a lot of stuff. But uh, yeah, this is like such a beautiful area that we like to spend a lot of time in. Uh, it's a little bit cooler than in there since we don't have air conditioning, but should we head down to the dock? Did you make that? No, a nice lady down the road from us made it. That's when it was built? That's when the stairs were built. 1953, is that the same time this cabin was built? Uh, cabin probably came first. W, you know what that stands for? Well in. And they've probably seen the dock already. You've seen the dock before. We got the sea dew, we got a couple kayaks, we got a kayak and the boat we need to pull out yet. Keeping my boat in the water has been, I thought I would be anxious about it, but since I got these whips, like having in the water is so nice being able to just rip out and fish for a couple hours. There's only been like one or two nights that I've actually been nervous having it in the water, but uh, it's crazy. We're like halfway through the season, um, put a lot of hours on the boat this year. Uh, I just did my mid-season oil change, which is a chance for me to shout out Princess Auto, get my oil, get my funnels, get the oil pump, all that stuff. I might do a video about that at some point, but anyways. Filters. Filters, oil filters, everything. I'll link them below. Princess Auto, always helping us out. But yeah, this is this is it. All right, we are going fishing, but I have a public service announcement first. We're actually gonna go back to the cabin because we're gonna have a little heart to heart. All right, guys, today's video is brought to you by the Invasive Species Center out of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. And uh, we're talking about grass carp, part of the Asian carp family, and they are invasive. You might be like, Jay, you live in Kenora, that has nothing to do with you, you know, why are you talking about it? But it does have to do with me. But instead of reading off a bunch of facts, which I'm, I'm gonna read off some facts yet, I wanted to talk to someone who's actually had, uh, you know, a run-in with grass carp and that have actually had them negatively affect their fisheries. Because up in, you know, Kenora, we don't, we're not really dealing with grass carp yet. Hopefully we never have to. They're starting to get, you know, into the Great Lakes, Lake areas where they've shown up a couple times. But I got my buddy Tyler Anderson, Tyler's Real Fishing. You should definitely check out his YouTube channel. He's an amazing teacher, does a lot of bass videos. He's uploading all the time. But anyways, I'll, I'll link him below, but I wanna give him a little FaceTime call because he is someone who's actually experienced firsthand the effects of grass carp. So we'll see if he actually, if he picks up his phone. We kinda didn't really plan this. Hello. Hello, we'll try this one more time. Okay. Tyler Anderson. Hello, how's it going everybody? Uh, good, I, th I think they're doing good. Guys, uh, we got Mr. Tyler Anderson, Tyler's Real Fishing. Okay, I'm gonna keep this quick because our service is probably bad and you're out catching monsters. Nah, uh, not yet. So I need to talk about grass carp and you know how they're bad. Obviously they're not in Lake of the Woods yet, but when they, when they approached me about talking about grass carp in the Invasive Species Center, I was just like, man, I remember you telling me about grass carp in your home lake and you're the only person I know that had a firsthand experience. Like what, what did grass carp do to you? So, of course, I, I, I'm not going to claim to be a biologist. Um, I claim to be a fisherman. And so I can only tell what lakes were like and then what they were not like and what the effect grass carp had on them. I grew up on a lake called Lake Austin. It was hydrilla heaven. I mean, more hydrilla than you even knew what to do with. And at times, when I would grow up not being a fisherman, as a wakeboarder and a, and a surfer and a tuber, I would hate the grass because, oh, the weeds get in my feet, whatever. But as soon as I got into fishing around middle school, I realized what a vast heaven this place is. And 
sadly, over the years, the grass kind of got too much that the city of Austin, Austin, Texas, tried to um, mitigate it by they had these big boats that would kind of churn the grass and uh, and kind of collect it, but they could never contain it fully. And, and sadly, they put in what they they claim is like something like seventy. 5,000 grass carp through they ate every shred of native and invasive grass in the entire lake and it went from being the number eight lake on the Bassmaster list in the country to being not even close to the top 1,000 I mean it's, wow. it's a trash hole now wow so okay moral of the story you wouldn't recommend having grass carp in your lake no uh, <laughs> if, if the if the fish in your body of water are dependent on grass and the ecosystem is yeah if you want to control it there's better ways of controlling it in my opinion than just uh, putting in a species that can spread and eradicate quicker than uh, than flies on rice. Man, that's crazy. Okay, well, that, you, you answered my question and then some. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, thanks to Tyler. But yeah, uh, I got some facts here about, about grass carp. And listen to this. A grass carp can eat up to 40% of their body weight and reach up to five feet long and more than 80 pounds in weight. So that's like, if it's an 80 pound fish, that's a lot of weeds. But basically, they're starting to show up in Lake Erie and the fears that they spread into all the Great Lakes and, and beyond that. So I'm gonna have some links below on you know what to do if you think you caught a grass carp, um, what to do with it, you shouldn't be releasing them. But one other thing I wanna list off is, there's a list here that I got sent and these are native species that would experience high to moderate impacts if grass carp were in their, in their lake, in their water body. Listen to this. Walleye, gizzard chad, white sucker, white bass. Those are all the species that would be affected if grass carp were in their system. So while it's not affecting me in the north right now, some of you guys that are watching the video are probably in the lake area in the Great Lake system. Uh, you know, it affects all of us, especially if they keep spreading as we go. So there's links below for identifying them. I'll overlay, you know, a, uh, an image showing you what to look for. But the segue into our fishing today is we're going walleye fishing and I would hate to have the walleye fishing compromise on Lake of the Woods by some grass carp coming in. So do your due diligence, do a little research, especially if you're fishing the Great Lakes and you know we can stop the spread of grass carp. Thank you to the Invasive Species Center for sponsoring this video. Sam and I are gonna head out on Lake of the Woods, catch some walleye. Boop boo! All right, grab the weapon. There's one bait caster in there. What are we doing today, Sam? Trying to catch some walleyes. How? Bottom bouncing. Oh, nice. Something we don't usually do. Exactly. As Sam said, we're bottom bouncing. And I, ha I don't bottom bounce on, on, on the channel very much. I haven't done many bottom bouncing videos. And there's a reason for it. It is boring. It is a very boring way to fish. Um, you're trolling. You're trolling at a very slow speed. I have a question. Yes. Why are we doing it? We are doing it because it is technique that's great when the fish are scattered, when the fish are tough, and like a tournament technique. I weighed in a bunch of my tournament fish uh, over the years, bottom bouncing with spinners because it is so effective. And sometimes you got to do what's most effective. Other times, and I'm fishing with lots of people on the boat, you know, jigs and leeches is great. You can have four or five people on the boat. Trolling gets a little more complicated. So for this, I don't really like more than two or three people doing it in the boat, but it's just, it's, it's a good way when the fish are scattered. We're gonna be fishing a main lake hump today. It's a pretty big spot. And I think the fish are gonna be kind of placed all throughout it. So rather than, you know, driving around, trying to drop on fish, move, drop on fish, move, we're gonna keep our lines in the entire time. I think it's a technique that everyone should know how to do. And yeah, it's not something I do a lot. All right, so the first thing you need for bottom bouncing is a bottom bouncer. I like to use heavier ones. A lot of the ones you'll see at your, like at the local corner tackle store are often lighter ones, but I like an ounce and a half to three ounce. My goal in a bottom bouncing is not to get my bottom bouncer way behind the boat. It's to stay vertical because when you stay vertical, this little wire is dragging on the ground, dragging on the, on the bottom of the lake right like this. And then your bait, which we'll talk about the different options is hanging, you know, a foot off the bottom. So it's a great way to keep your bait off the bottom. It's almost like drop shotting. I mean, the weight's on the bottom and your lure is perfectly above in the strike zone. So it's such a good technique for driving around. So we got bottom bouncers. Next is what you put behind it. Uh, I'll show you some close-ups since we have them rigged, but uh, these are spinners. So it's, it's often a blade. There's obviously a bunch of different types of blades you can use. Hook configurations for using leeches or minnows or crawlers. Um, I'll show you those once you get them tied on. But there's some other options. You can use a small little hook 
called slow death, which is a, a very good finesse technique. It's a hook with a little bend in it. I'll, I'll inset a shot. And some people have had great success bottom balancing just one of those slow death hooks with a little chunk of nightcrawler. Or you can go to the big end of the spectrum and you can you know, troll a big floating rapala or a big crankbait behind it, which is another great way to get maybe a shallower diving crankbait right in front of their face. Today, we're gonna keep it basic. We're gonna use some spinners, we're gonna use some crawlers and uh, hopefully catch some walleyes. All right, guys, so as far as rods for bottom bouncers, you want something softer. You don't want a, a, a stiff pool cue because it's a small hook. The bites are pretty light. Sometimes they're, they're tough to feel. So I'm using like a more moderate rod, which means it, it bends more in the middle. It's not just the tip that's bending, it's more down the middle. Um, and then as far as line goes, I'm going, I'm going with heavier braid, like 20, 30 pound braid, because you're not gonna spook the fish. And if you get snagged, whatever, like you're gonna have a lighter leader section on your spinner, obviously, but your main line doesn't need to be light. Um, because that weight is gonna bring it down. It won't, uh, it won't affect it too much if your line's a little bit thicker. But I'll show you the rigging I like to do here. So these clevises are like a, a quick release clevis. So if I wanna ever change weights, I can actually just snap that weight off like that and then you just have the clevis. And the nice thing is when you're traveling as well, then you can take the weight off. It doesn't bounce around in your rod locker. Here's a rod I have rigged up ready. Right here at my swivel, you can see I have my quick release snap and then a chunk of fluorocarbon, which then is the business end right there. There you've got just a hammered gold blade, a couple beads, and an octopus hook, which you're gonna put some crawler on. Um, I know a lot of rigs have two hooks, depending on what you wanna do. This is what I got rigged on, this we're gonna use for now. We're gonna snap this back on. So as you can see, now the bottom bouncer's hooked up. If we ever need to switch it, we can pop it off if we feel we need a heavier one. And there you go, we got one rod ready to go. As for bait, we got some crawlers. This is probably my first time using night crawlers this summer. They don't look great, <laughs> but they're still alive and that's the important part. Uh, you definitely don't need to use a full crawler, you can. Pretty straightforward, sometimes I like to thread it onto the hook a little bit. A, a longer night crawler might be nice to have two hooks, but even something like that, it's gonna be fine. The walleye's gonna eat the whole thing. All right, we are gonna get the camera on the front easy cam post and we're gonna start trolling. Um, I'll talk about speeds and all that stuff as we go. Uh, very handy, this is where like a trolling motor through remote comes in, comes in handy, obviously. You can do it with the big motor. Um, the speeds are sometimes tough to achieve um, going forward, so you could back troll this route. So that, that's another option you don't have a trolling motor. I'll show you guys that as well. But first, we're gonna start off with the trolling motor. But uh, here we go, Lake of the Woods Walleyes. Okay, you can drop down until you hit bottom. Okay, I hit bottom. Okay, and then you kind of just want to keep yourself hitting bottom, you know, as, as little as possible. You want to be touching bottom, you don't want to be like just dragging in the mud. So, ideal speed for bottom bouncing. Um, I think it's like, you know, around 0.7 to 1.2, somewhere in there, but definitely on the slower side, definitely slower than crankbaits. And that's why, you know, with the remote, it's really nice to dial in um, exactly, you know, what you want. There's a setting called cruise control. Nope. <laughs> the next thing we'll talk about is hook setting. Um, with these heavy weights and the small hooks, you really don't need to do much of a hook set. You're pretty much just gonna reel into it once, once that fish is there, but. You got a fish? Sam's hooked up. It looks very small. <laughs> Bring it in. <laughs> Show the camera your catch. So basically now I'm trying to get that bottom out. So I'm trying to feel it tick bottom and then just lift it up a bit. Just so I'm touching bottom every once in a while, lifting up, touching bottom. Because you can definitely snag these bottom bouncers especially at this, at this slow pace. So right now, you know, my bottom bouncer isn't straight vertical. It's probably at, you know, 45 behind the boat, but this is such a good technique when you're fishing big spots. When I'm fishing a small spot, obviously like drop shotting, jigging, something, something vertical uh, is, is fantastic. But on a bigger reef, um, you know, some lakes set up differently, some parts of lakes set up differently. This can be, you know, much more effective. There we go. We've got a little more weight. Yeah, so it's not a crazy hook set. It's kind of just trying to sweep into it. And that's a nice wallet. This guy is gonna get released into some catch and cook spicy, if I were to guess. Perfect. Guess? Just a no little, just. Oh, he opened his mouth. Just one. Back. For the camera. Back. There we go. Mm, I think I'm okay right now. Like I said, this is not exciting, 
but it puts, puts so many fish in the boat. Two walleye J, one perch Sam. Fish? Nice. I got one too. Uh-oh. It's okay. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Listen to my words. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's gone. Holy smokes! <laughs> that was instant. Our line down versus fish caught ratio is pretty good. I got one too. I think, or I'm, oh, I'm tangled. Never mind. You got one? Wow. All right. Option number one, using the trolling motor. It works great. Option number two is back trolling, and that's what tillers are so great for. Uh, if you are gonna back troll, having wave whackers, these plexiglass pieces that I have on my boat are essential. I'll, I'll link them below, but yeah. It, otherwise- Also great for advertising. And great to put stickers on. But yeah, then it, it stops the splashing, and um, yeah, that you have just so much more control with the tiller going backwards into the wind. There isn't much wind today, but enough that it'll slow our boat down. If you try to go nose into the wind, you'll just have no control. That wind will blow your nose all over the place. That's why back trolling is such, such an effective way to, to back, to back troll. That's why back trolling is so effective for back trolling, for, for uh, bottom bouncing. Got him. Ooh, that's a little bit nicer. Lake of the Woods gold. I think that's all we're gonna keep for today. The rest are going back, but we got a good fish fry coming up tonight. Look at the little baby. Whoa! Oh, Nelly. I don't know why we don't bottom bounce more often. Bring him in. Ah! Here nice. There we go. Another nice one. All right, guys, here's the spot we're fishing. I'll zoom out a little bit. As you can see, there's just this big strip reef that tops out at like 14 feet of water and that's where the fish are sitting. They're sitting anywhere off the tip in 30 to right on top in 14. So I could stop and jig, but just trolling, as you can see, we're just contacting fish nonstop. So that's what we're doing. You can see the lines back and forth and back and forth. And that's where bottom bouncing just is so effective. All right, guys, as you can see, we are hammering the fish. Um, if we wanted to, we could put a crankbait behind the spinner. That would definitely, you know, target bigger fish. But uh, if you're just looking for action, catching a lot of fish, this has been, it's been insane. And yeah, like I've mentioned, not something we do enough. It's a big one. <laughs> Jay, get the net. <laughs> get the net. Oh, that's a nice, oh, pike. Ah! <laughs> oh, no, you don't need the net in there. Wow, so he doesn't destroy it. Oh, I thought this was gonna be a big walleye, right? Is there? All right was not the big wall I wanted. But we got a nose piercing today. There's one. We have not gone long without fish. We're gonna finish our pass on this spot and then we're gonna go look for Big Margaret 30 incher. Okay, let's move. We're gonna go find a bigger one. Well, we're back, spot number two, looking for something a little bigger. Hooked up, it did not take long. There are so many walleyes this size in Lake of the Woods. Okay, it's tiny. Show some excitement for the viewers at home. Ah! Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> not a jumbo, but they're snapping nonstop. Oh, I'm on. Well, that's a nice one. Chain Sam's walleye adventures. Oh, he pooped all over my hand. Wow. Doubled up. <laughs> Is yours a little better? Get the net. Get the net? It's a small mouth.
Do you want one? Yeah. <laughs> I found a little bass. It's pretty cute. She's on. Nice. That's pulling a bit. Oh, I got one too. Okay, you stand oh. up. Nice. All right, I think we're ending it with this double header. Is he still on? Yep. Your fish is bigger this time. There you go, ending it off with a double header. Mine's a little more impressive this time. <laughs> Guys, the basics of bottom balancing, get a soft rod, more of a moderate action. And that being said, don't let your gear stop you from doing it. If you just have a stiffer spinning rod, use it. It'll be fine, it'll still work. Um, ideal setup is more of a moderate bait casting setup. I like 20 to 30 pound braid. Um, the leader line for the spinner for the slow death, you know, somewhere in that six to 12 pound range. I think that's it. Bottom bouncing isn't the most exciting way, but as you can see, we fished for like two and a half hours, crushed the fish, and uh, it's, it's pretty foolproof. So just a great way to cover water. Don't forget to wear your life jackets. Pick up your trash. And don't forget to report if you catch any grass carp in the Great Lakes. Once again, thanks for them sponsoring this video. I will link them below so you can learn more about the invasive species that risk all of our waterways. Anyways guys, catch you next time.